What did I do in lockdown? Um, it's a very good question and uh, one I'll hopefully uh, um, explore over the next few, few minutes. And, um, you know, with, with, with many maps, you, you kind of find inspiration in some really rather bizarre places, <clears throat> or at least I do. You know, I'm constantly sort of thinking about ideas as I'm wandering around. So I go back a couple of years and I happen to be wandering in um, Tiffany & Co., the, the jewellers in New York City. Um, you know, looking, clearly not buying, because that would be ridiculous. But um, I was I was very taken with this piece of art that was hanging on the wall um, in, in the shop, um, one of the top floors. Um, <clears throat> and it's a bas relief uh, of Charles Lewis Tiffany, um, the founder of the store. And if you look very closely at it, it's basically a load of screws um, that are driven into a, a piece of wood. Uh, at different heights and then painted on the top and from a distance it, it obviously just looks like a painting uh, but when you get close up you can see all of the individual screws and the different elements and I, I, I just really liked it I thought it looked great um, a minor issue is that the screw heads were non-aligned but I'll, I'll return to that little bugbear later so as many of you probably know <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, I make a lot of election maps. And here's one of the um, 2016 presidential election. Actually, hark harking back to, to Sam's talk earlier, this is a dosimetric dot density with every single vote on, on the map. Um, and as we were getting up to 2020 election uh, in November 2020, people started asking me about what I was going to come up with for that particular election. And for some reason, people want new different you know you can't just keep churning out the same old map year after year um, because people have an appetite to see something slightly new something slightly different um, and then you know covid times hit early 2020 i found myself working at home as we all are um, i had a lot more time to think i also had access to non-standard office space including my garage and a whole range of different cartographic tools and i recalled that uh, that screwed bass relief Tiffany uh, piece of art and I started conceiving of a, a map in my uh, head a th sort of a 3D thematic map so first up was deciding on what constituted the terrain for the screw height um, I've seen a few people make maps of DEMs using screws but I wanted this to be thematic data I prototyped using 2016 election results and here's turnout which is, a, a, I guess, a proxy for population density. And I decided that was going to be my terrain, where people live as opposed to where they don't. And I'd encode the actual voting patterns differently. Um, so using a GIS that I'm paid to use, I constructed a grid of points. Um, I represented them with screw head symbols to get a sense of the sort of density and what would work for this map. And I basically settled on a 50 mile interval grid. It was a one to seven million map. Uh, it was about 60 by 40 centimeters. And in total, that was 1,162 screws. So screw height and diameter was gonna be turnout. I was gonna paint some red. I was gonna paint some blue. I was gonna make some light and some dark, darker um, to illustrate share of the vote. <clears throat> so I needed a base map. And it was time to start building. Uh, rather than go digital, I wanted to do something physical. Um, and in some ways, this is the kind of counterpart to Jess's fab fabulous map that she's just talked about. I just used power tools instead of very intricate tools. So there was a lot of work I could do without knowing the results. First up, make the base. I basically used a piece of old kitchen uh, butcher block countertop that I had lying around after we, we renovated our kitchen. And I cut the base to 70 by 50 centimeters to accommodate uh, the map size and scale and used power tool number one, which was a circular saw with a very blunt blade. <clears throat> so top tip, always use a sharp blade. Once I'd locked in the dimensions of the base block, um, I exported the map from uh, the GIS that I'm paid to use and um, got some five millimeter plywood and used a CNC router uh, which is power tool two to cut the shapes of the US states into, into, the, um, into the plywood uh, and create individual jigsaw pieces almost. <clears throat> and I positioned the plywood 
uh, states on the base, the, the butcher block, and I traced around them with a pencil. And crucially, for areas of land or islands that abutted water, I left a, a, about a one centimetre buffer uh, for reasons that would become quite literally clear towards the end. So what did, what did I do next? Well, I got out another power tool. So this is really just an experiment in seeing how many tools I can get you go through. Uh, the plan was to inlay the states into the base itself. So I got a, a Dremel out. I set the root a bit to about 75 millimeters, uh, which gave me the precision to basically chisel out or hollow out the outlines I'd drawn. But I needed a bit more power to dig out <clears throat> the, core, the core of the map itself. Power tool four. This is a Black and Decker router. Um, this has about a hard, half inch router bit, which made really light work of hollowing out the, the core of the map's base. So this is what I ended up with, um, which looks very rough and ready. But as with any cartographic work, the finished product is going to hide all of this rough work um, and no, no one will ever see it except you today. That's it. So I placed the pieces into the inlay just to make sure they fitted. Um, I also used power tool number five. We're back to the Dremel, but now with a flexible attachment and some sanding bits uh, to make minor modifications, make sure everything fitted well. Um, you know, you obviously want to make sure all the bits on your map fit together nicely. In the meantime, I did a bit of nerdy research into wood screws and I went down all sorts of rabbit holes that I really probably shouldn't have done uh, and found all the different gauges and lengths which they manufactured. I decided on 10 different screw sizes to create 10 classes of turnout values and screws would have larger gauges and larger screw heads as well as being taller for a higher turnout. Um, and with that, I could determine the number of screws, screws I was going to need of each gauge, diameter and length. I also calculated the depth that needed to be driven into the map. I confused my metric and imperial measurements um, and decided uh, how much of the screw would be protruding. So I ordered up uh, about 1,500 brass screws with a few spares to deal with any changes in turnout between 2016 and 2020. And they sat around for a few months. So back to the map base. This would be around October 2020, about a month away from the election. I primed all of the map shape, shapes um, with an undercoat, and I laid them out on a table in likely piles of blue and red. Um, I, I could probably have given many states their final coat of paint at that point. Um, the front two piles are pretty much always going to be the same colour from one election to the next. But there was a pile of um, marginal states and unknowns, and I decided to leave them until the result was known, which turned out not to be that simple, did it? So I sat back in November, I marked off the states as the results came in, which ended up taking a couple of weeks due to, well, let, let's not go there, shall we? And eventually I, I got around to being able to paint the states without fear of, of legal challenge. Uh, but it did, it did take me a little bit longer than need be. But as you will well know, once you commit something to a map, particularly if it's physical, um, it stays there. It's very difficult to change. I ended up with a pile of blue states and a pile of red states. And I glued the jigsaw of red and blue states into the hollowed out base with a hole, if you can just manage to see it, for the Great Salt Lake in Utah, because it's just simply too big to ignore. Um, some bits were quite fiddly. Um, the Hawaiian Islands in particular were really tricky to glue into place. Okay, back to the digital um, map. Uh, time to sort out where all the screws goes. Screws go. Um, I attributed each point feature um, with the turnout data and then classified that into those 10 classes that I was on about. And each screw then had um, a gauge, a size by shank hole, um, and size by shank hole size. So I figured out the, the correct depth. Each screw must be driven into the map. And I put gauge, shank diameter, and depth as labels for each of the points on the map. And given that this map was absolutely never, ever going to be seen by anyone at all, ever, um, I left the completely clumsy default GIS legend with uh, six decimal places um, of my, my data points, which you should obviously never do. I now needed to print that out because it was going to become, become a template. Um, but of course, I couldn't get into work to use our very nice large format printers. So I printed this out at home 
uh, on eight pieces of paper, uh, tape them together um, with Scotch magic tape, which uh, lies at the heart of so many great maps. And that became my template that I positioned across the map. And I then started the process of creating all 1,162 pilot holes based on the labels on the template. So power tool six, back to the Dremel with various drill bits and a plunger to correct to get the correct depth. <clears throat> so why did I have to do this process? Why didn't I just drive the screws in? Well, I'd have split the plywood, um, particularly with so many holes at such close proximity to one another. So this was really necessary. It was a, a very fiddly part of the process, but really important. And once the template was peeled back and there was more mess to clear up, but I'd made what I thought was actually quite a beautiful pattern in its own right, which I, I really liked. Um, and it kind of looks like a map of proportional tree ring symbols. Um, unfortunately, once I'd cleaned it up, there was actually no damage. So I'd managed to um, you know, basically destroy by putting all these drill holes in of the, of the map, but part of the process that was very necessary. So then it was a case of cleaning up the base map, adding filler where necessary, varnishing it, uh, then driving the screws into their correct holes. Um, and remember the bugbear I had with the Tiffany artwork, not here, uh, only aligned Phillips screw heads for this particular cartoon nerd. I couldn't, I just couldn't deal with all different angles, had to be all, all properly aligned. Uh, so it was slow progress. I enlisted more power. Power tool number seven, electric screwdriver came to the rescue. This reduced the soreness, it reduced the blistering, and the manual screwdriver then was just used to align the screw heads very slightly at the end. I'd already had a nameplate made with a playful title, um, again, using the CNC router. Um, and bear in mind, when I conceived of this map and the title, I didn't know who was going to win the election. So you can kind of take this title whichever way you particularly want. So there are some you know, subtle political connotations depending on how you viewed the result. And once all the screws were in the map, the nameplate was itself screwed to the map, um, but it wasn't finished. I've just got brass screws atop the red and blue states at this particular uh, point. So back to that ditch that I'd... Um, there's my dog, Wisley, shut up. You're, you're up in a minute. Um, every map has to have some sort of vignette or water lining. So from the outset, I decided I'd create a hollowed out buffer um, which was then filled with epoxy resin. And here it's just been poured. You can still see the bubbles, which thankfully dissipated a little bit more as it, as it dried. So back to the computer, I created an interpolated surface of the 2020 share of the vote. I moved the map from the garage to the home office. And rather than get all technical, I just simply eyeballed the, the computer map and painted the screw heads um, by hand with enamel paint. So every screw head got a relevant shade of red or blue, the dark meaning a larger share of the vote, typical symbology. And here's the final multivariate 3D map. Screw height, gauge diameter is turnout. Base color is red or blue to show the state result. Screw heads are shaded according to the share of the vote. Uh, and on this map in particular, you can see the large swathes of heavy Republican share of the vote. Uh, but among very small populations, and contrast that with areas of large populations who tended to vote Democrat. So zooming in a little bit, just to a couple of examples, the Southeast with large proportions, uh, with sorry, with large populations of marginal voting, uh, just tipped Republican in Florida, and they just tipped Democrat in Georgia. The predominantly Democratic Northwest, with many, many uh, large populations of predominantly democratic uh, voting. And the highly populated and predominantly democratic West Coast with the largest screw on the map uh, right there in the center. So given I'd already built the map in ArcGIS Pro, I, I figured it ought to get its digital twin as a 3D scene, which can be animated easily as, as well as queried. So you can click on the screws to actually find out what the, the data says at that particular point. Um, and I've simply published it as an, as an animation, um, as, as hopefully you're able to, to see at the moment. Hopefully the bandwidth gives it enough to, to be rendered properly. Uh, here, the screws of each state are the same color according to the margin of victory for that state. So it's a slightly different approach I took. 
Now, with, with every piece of uh, cartography, uh, QA is extremely important, as you've already heard. Uh, our dog has a very, very important part in the process. Um, so after months of work, I put the map out um, and our dog, Wisley, uh, was left fairly unimpressed here. Um, he didn't cock his leg, so it wasn't a complete failure, um, but you know he just walked away, didn't, didn't care much for it. Now, interestingly, um, I don't have a place to put this map. <laughs> this is a bit heavy for the wall, so I really don't know where, where to put it. It's still in the garage, actually, as I, as I speak. Back to Wisley, though, to be fair, he was more interested in his own map. So I'm actually going to sort of um, shuffle sideways into a completely different lockdown project just for the last few minutes. Um, I guess it's my second personal lockdown project, uh, but it is really more about um, our dog. So I decided back in sort of March uh, 2020 um, that I would make a map of Wisley's walks during lockdown. So we basically strapped uh, an old GPS receiver that I had lying around that I used to use to, um, to map um, ski trails when I was off snowboarding. And um, I sort of got it out of retirement and we put it on his collar every time we went out for a, a morning or evening walk. Um, and then basically imported the track logs into um, the GIS software that, uh, that I use and um, saw what we had over a year. Um, so I'm just going to rifle through a few examples. The resulting map is deliberately abstract. It's devoid of context to avoid making it too easy to spot where Wisley and his owners live. Um, this is his range for his morning walks um, in total. Um, all overlaid one on top of each other with a bit of transparency just to uh, give it a nice aesthetic. So you can see where there are more and where there are slightly less. Um, his morning walks tend to be short and local. He stretched out his evening walks somewhat, um, tends to go a little bit further. When it was cooler during what we call winter here in California, which is when the temperature drop, drops below 30, um, he preferred longer walks. Uh, obviously, when it was hotter, those are the days when it was over 35 degrees, he didn't venture too far. These again tended to be shorter walks. Um, but I mean, remember, he, he just does wear a very thick fur coat. So I, I don't blame him at all. I mean, I wouldn't go out for a walk in this sort of temperature. It'd be ridiculous. This was the pattern on days when there was no rain. He didn't care that there was no rain. And he also didn't care when there was rain. It didn't seem to bother him one bit. He'd get a very wet fur coat and we all got wet but but he seemed to enjoy it and that that was important his longest walk was a 5.2 kilometer circuit um, and his shortest walk was just a couple of hundred meters there and back on a particularly lazy day and we tend to we tend to leave him to decide where to actually go on his walk so he's very much in control of of where he wants to go um, he enjoyed his local parks uh, this is a park called caroline park um, lots of little paths that he can go on. Uh, here's a, another one in Redlands, Prospect Park. Again, lots of nice little paths and routes that he, he tended to follow. And the golf course <clears throat> closed uh, to, to play um, during the pandemic, um, but it did actually open up for exercise and they allowed dog walkers to exercise their dogs on the, the course. So he enjoyed the particularly lush grass um, of the fairways, although I will note that he has failed uh, to find any of the dozens of golf balls that I have lost on that particular course. Useless. Uh, we made a map that emphasised his favourite, his most common routes, I guess you could say. You could split them into small multiples to create monthly summaries uh, of his adventures that evidence his, his response to heat in particular. Um, but also how interesting over the year, he began to connect routes into larger, more connected mental maps, um, rather than going to very sort of uh, localized specific circuits, he would then he would jump from one circuit that he was familiar with to a whole different one that he was familiar with and, and created larger um, circuits. Um, wrong way. <clears throat> as, as I quite often do, I look to, to the past to uh, informed sort of contemporary visualizations. And um, this is the famous Florence Nightingale um, polar area charts uh, graph, but this is Wisley's walks over his year. 
um, split by, by month uh, and also by minimum, maximum, mean length of walks across the year. I also um, experimented with 3D space time cubes, but decided never ever to show this abomination to anyone at all. Um, so please wipe it from your memory. 3D is hard. It often gets in the way and uh, often doesn't add very much to the story you want to tell. So I, I ultimately settled on creating a, a long form 20 minute animation. Um, and I, I do uh, very much sympathize, sympathize with Sam's problems of rendering um, that he mentioned earlier. This is a, a, a 20 minute animation that took probably 20 odd hours or so to export and render. Uh, and it's a year's worth of his walks, which you can find on YouTube just by searching for Wisley walks. Um, <clears throat> the top hit, by the way, will be RHS Wisley in Surrey um, and the walks around that particular set of gardens. But that's why Wisley is named Wisley anyway, because he's named after RHS Wisley. But I think it's the second hit if you if you if you look. So he walked uh, 1,332 maps, uh, my, my maps, miles in total. Uh, he kept his owners relatively sane. Uh, the routes are colored by frequency of walk to add emphasis. The, Current walks had an animated worm or a little whizzly, I guess, uh, and a flash as the walk is finished. There's a cumulative mile count in the, the bottom left and a sort of a whizzly cartoon scale bar as well. Um, although uh, eagle eyed viewers of a certain age will notice that's actually rhubarb, uh, the cartoon dog from the 1970s cartoon rhubarb and custard. Um, the bar graph illustrates temperature and actually changes uh, in terms of um, opacity um, as the um, as the monthly sort of timeline across the bottom changes. So as we go from month to month, um, the map updates uh, that information. Also, it updates the text panel slightly, so you get a little bit of a narrative about what happened in that particular month. Um, and occasionally, you'll see place names pop up, like golf course or shop or something, something else. So if, if you have twenty minutes spare to um, just sit back and watch Wisley walk for an entire year, um, then, then take a look. So uh, that's pretty much it. Um, that was me in lockdown. Um, I also, as you probably imagine now, developed a fetish for power tools over the year. Um, and this last one was particularly good fun, uh, but it's a completely different talk. And you'll be delighted to know that I was prevented from using it to dig out any form of map in the garden. Although I, I, did, I did get rather tempted at some point. Maybe that's a project for the next pandemic. So with that, thank you very much. Um, oh, in terms of real work, I wrote another book. So there we go, um, Thematic Mapping. It was published last week and it's basically a shed load of maps. And with that, that's it, Paul. Thank you very much. Thanks, Ken. Um, amazing to see what you've been up to in lockdown. Two really great projects. Um, and just to say before we move on, they're both up for awards as well, aren't they? If I remember rightly, have I seen those both? Uh, yeah, I just I throw some stuff in every year just to have fun. Okay. Well, good luck with those tomorrow anyway. <laughs> Hopefully Thanks, they Paul. do well. Um, did you did you own all those tools? Have, have you gone out and bought those specifically for uh, I've, i actually bought the dremel right um but the rest the rest i had lying around from various diy projects and yeah. um you know why why wouldn't you go out and buy power tools i mean yeah, there, there are some that i i i wanted i mean i fancied a really nice big table saw but i, I just couldn't justify it because i just simply needed to create one straight line on that butcher block so the the <laughs> the circular sword did the job, right? I, yeah, yeah, yeah. I just couldn't justify it. Um, I probably didn't even need the giant mechanical digger at the end, but that was fun. Just to hire that. So you've done garden. a bit of landscaping as well, I'm assuming. Well, they, they, I was actually digging holes for trees to go in, so um, okay. you know, yeah, pretty yeah, mature yeah. trees. So I, um, yeah, it'll be interesting to see your next project. <laughs> well, it's actually really. I I've, I found. Generally speaking, you know, so many of the, the cartographers I know, um, it's not just it's not just what they do for a living, right? It's no, also no, no, no. Uh, 
a personal um it, yeah it's just something that I, I call it kind of a geo lifestyle you know it's something that you find interesting in in almost every aspect of of life and, and so many people who i know um you know do do mappy stuff on the side um that's detached from their everyday mappy stuff yeah so you know yeah. whether it's the lino cut or whether it's mm. you know power tools or you know maps made out of gunpowder i've seen and um cyanotype um atlases there's there's just some great stuff out there real real creative stuff yeah. um and maybe that's the outlet isn't it because um you know often during the day job you're constrained to an extent mm. um either in specs or with the work you've got to do or the map you have to make um so you know having a creative outlet to um you know go wild on that's fine well, i'd agree i totally agree with that and i think i think you know, Toppy spoke about the 30 day map challenge at, at the start. And I think that gave a lot of people an opportunity to do stuff with tools and with data that they'd never used before to have a kind of purpose as well. Because quite often, you know, some people might not have that idea to actually then go away and create something new. So to kind of have that structure that that 30 day map challenge gave you for some people, not for everyone, mm. would have been really valid. Um, so, yeah, so it's really interesting. So it'd be interesting to see what you do with it then, where, where it ends up. I don't know where to put it. <laughs> I don't really genuinely don't. It's just, I've got nowhere to put it. Right. <laughs> you know, right. once I've done it, it's just sort of sat there. And like, now what? I don't know. Now what do I do with it? Maybe I should phone up Tiffany's and ask them if they want. <laughs> it looks else. amazing. I mean, it looks amazing. It's it was fun. It was good for art. <laughs>